As I got closer to our place, I stopped cold. What the heck? I had just come back from my trip. The place should be empty, but there was a light shining from our bedroom. I was certain I locked up when I left. Why was there a light on? Could we have been robbed? The only ones with keys are Troy and me. And he's not due back for weeks. A rush of dread hit me. But I couldn't just stand there paralyzed. Doing nothing could cost me. I immediately dialed 911. A hello, officer. There's a light on in my place, but no one's supposed to be there. When the officers showed up, we cautiously entered, heading down the hall and flinging open the bedroom door. What met my eyes was the last thing I expected. My name is Amy. I'm 30, and I work at a big-time food company. A couple of years back, a product I pitched took off big time, and I just got bumped up the ladder. More work, for sure, but it felt good being someone the team relied on. Plus, the pay bump let me sock away more cash. I've always been a penny pincher, making every dollar count. And here's why. Three years ago, I married Troy, and that was a game changer. Work used to be my whole world, but now it's all about family and home. I dream about having a kid and getting our dream house. But dreams aren't cheap. Realizing these dreams means being realistic about finances. We would need money for children and a home. I wouldn't want our child to be deprived of experiences because of money. I want our kid to have the best of everything, trying out whatever they're into. It might be getting ahead of myself, but I can't help but plan for our future. When I got my promotion last year, the first person I rang up was Troy. He'd moved for his job about half a year before my big news. So I called him right away. Troy, you won't believe it. I got that promotion. No way. That's awesome. Yeah, and with the raise, we can stash even more for our future. Guess I better up my game then. Just keep an eye on that wallet. Even with distance between us, I can't help but worry about him. He can be a bit scatterbrained, especially when it comes to his stuff. He loses things, buys replacements without really looking, and then ends up with doubles. When we were living together, I could keep him on track. But now, it's tougher. He knows my dreams of kids and a home. And while I worry a little, deep down, I trust him. Fast forward about a year. Troy only makes it back to our place every few months. I love to see him more, but flights aren't cheap. This weekend, after a two months gap, he's back. I finished work early, cooked all his favorites, and just waited. Around 9 p.m., I heard the front door. I popped out of the kitchen to welcome him. And there he was, my Troy. Look who's here. I dashed over, and he scooped me up, laughing. <laughs> hey there. Missed me? I came straight from work. Aw, thanks. Nah, got some sleep on the flight. Oh, I got you some chocolates. They're your favorite, right? Wow, thanks. I absolutely love them. That's what I wanted to hear. Now, how about dinner? I'm starving here. I made all your favorites. Let's eat together. I grabbed his hand, pulling him toward the dining room. Seeing the feast laid out, 
His eyes lit up. We dove in, savoring every second of the reunion I've been waiting for. We chatted and enjoyed our meal together. After we ate, I let him hop in the shower first, thinking I'd go after. Once I finished up some chores and got to the bedroom, I noticed he quickly set his phone down, like he was trying to hide something. What's up with the phone? I asked, getting that uneasy feeling. But he just looked away. Then he snapped back to his normal self. Wasn't trying to hide it. Just didn't want to be glued to it when you walked in. You didn't need to do that. It's pointless to be on my phone when we finally get to be together. I want to make the most of our time. Look at you, being all sweet. Hey, are you making fun of me? I was trying to have a moment here. My bad. I really did appreciate it. I moved to snuggle up to him, but he caught my hand saying, We're both exhausted. Let's just crash. And quickly went under the covers. I couldn't get another word out, just whispered night and lay down. I was hoping we'd have some quality time in the bedroom, especially since it had been ages since we'd been together. I mean, it was only 11 p.m., and we both had tomorrow off. He knows I've been wanting to start a family. Feeling a mix of emotions, I forced myself to drift off, tears slipping out, because it felt like I was the only one excited about our time. He stayed two nights, but there wasn't any spark, not even a hint of it. As he was heading out, promising he'd come back soon, I just blurted, Do you not feel the same anymore? Where is this coming from? You've been so distant, and I've been feeling alone. I'm sorry. Work's just been a beast. I wanted to spend some time with you, just being together, you know? I'm 30, Troy. We've talked about kids. I gotta go, or I'll miss my flight. We'll chat later. He said, darting out before I could say anything. Normally, I'd drive him to the airport, but not this time. Our communication dwindled from that point. I'm sleepy, and I have to get up early tomorrow, were his favorite excuses when trying to evade the kid and house talk and hang up. It was obvious that we weren't on the same page anymore. After that, we barely spoke. In the midst of all this, my job ramped up with a three-night, four-day work trip on the horizon. As I was packing, Troy called. He usually texts, so this was out of the blue. Excitedly, I picked up. Hey, what's going on? You've got the business trip tomorrow, right? Uh, for three days? Yeah, that's the plan. Normally, it's just overnight. But this one's a biggie, huh? The company must really be counting on you. Good for you. Thanks. I hope so. But why the call about the trip? I just wanted to say knock him dead. I know it'll be tough, but don't work too hard. Aw, oh, thanks. It was good hearing from you. Feeling a little brighter after our chat, I went back to packing, feeling uplifted by his kindness. I attacked my business trip with a new zeal. Maybe it was Troy's call giving me a boost, but I wrapped things up faster than expected and got home a day ahead of schedule. I was in the mood to relax back home after wrapping up my business trip early, maybe even share a drink with my husband on Zoom. So on my way, I swung by a store to pick up my go-to beer and some munchies. Though I was worn out from the trip, I felt a spring in my step heading back. I need to ring him up and say, 
your call gave me the push I needed. It might also be a good time to dive back into our chat about kids and our future place. While making my way home, I started drafting a text to him. But as I got closer to our place, I stopped cold. What the heck? I had just come back from my trip. The place should be empty, but there was a light shining from our bedroom. I was certain I locked up when I left. Why was there a light on? Could we have been robbed? The only ones with keys are Troy and me, and he's not due back for weeks. A rush of dread hit me, but I couldn't just stand there paralyzed. Doing nothing could cost me. I immediately dialed 911. Hello, officer. There's a light on in my place, but no one's supposed to be there. All right, ma'am. Can you give me your address? Sure, it's. A cop showed up in no time. I quickly filled him in, and we both made our way to the apartment. My heart was racing as we inched down the hallway. We reached the bedroom door, and after a brief look at each other, he burst in. What the? Huh? Both of us were taken off guard, because right there, in all his glory, was my very naked. Husband, what the? Why are you here, Amy? And is that a cop? What's happening? He looked totally caught off guard, still standing there with nothing on. The cop seemed a bit embarrassed, obviously waiting to see my next move. I managed to say, "Why are you here early?" Weren't you coming back next month? I got a break, but why are you here? Weren't you returning from your trip tomorrow? I wrapped up ahead of schedule. Is that an issue? No, it just caught me off guard. Thought I'd surprise you. Oh, is that so? Then who's that under the covers? Um. When we entered, I had spotted a face peeking out from the covers, likely belonging to a woman I didn't know. She probably assumed she was hidden because she hadn't budged. But I saw her. My husband, clearly flustered, tried to play it cool. Anger bubbled up inside me. You think you can just laugh this off? How much more are you planning on playing me for a fool? I won't forgive you for this. You won't just brush this one under the rug. Without waiting, I pushed past him and yanked the covers away. There was a faint "ugh" from behind me. Uncovered was a young woman. Um, who the hell are you? I demanded. My voice. I see. The woman, her face pale, wouldn't meet my eyes, and said nothing. Perhaps she hoped that staying silent about being the other woman might defuse the situation. With the evidence right in front of me, both of them exposed, I quickly took out my phone and took photos. They tried to cover up, but it was too late. I also shot a video for extra evidence. The cop, who was still there, looked pretty taken aback by my actions. I then turned to him and said, "Could you get her out of here? She's a stranger in my home. Isn't this a form of trespassing?" Um, but she's with your husband, right? This apartment's in my name, and I have no clue who she is. Please, escort her out. I held my ground. The officer, although reluctant, did as I asked. 
He waited for the woman to get dressed, and then let her out. Troy, pale and looking rattled, tried to explain. Amy, this isn't what it looks like. There's a reason. He started to reach out. Maybe thinking a hug might somehow fix things. I snapped. Who does he think I am? I whacked his arms, reaching me, glared at him, and said, "So what now? You thought some sweet talk would make it all better? Is that why you were secretive with your phone? Is that why you kept your distance because of her? No, I was just. I felt alone being so far away, and ended up on a dating app, and I mean." Save your lame excuses. You thought you could play me? I'll make sure both of you pay for this. And you, pack your stuff and leave now. Like I said before, this apartment's mine. I had it before we got married. Frustrated with Troy's reluctance to get moving, I reached out to his parents. After filling them in. They showed up, and to my surprise, they brought divorce papers with them. His dad let him have it, and made him sign the papers right then and there. Troy was a mess, trying to hold on, but I was done. His folks took him back to their place. I filed the divorce papers right away, and even got an attorney to secure alimony. Last I heard. Troy's living with his folks, working nonstop at a factory run by a family friend. All the money he makes goes straight to his parents, and he doesn't have a dime or any freedom to his name. As for me, I use the alimony to kickstart a new chapter in a place close to work. Only my parents know where I'm at. So I doubt I'll bump into Troy. From here on out, it's just me. It's a little lonely, but I'm calling the shots now. I'll treat myself right, and look forward to better days ahead. On a snowy day with freezing temperatures, I discovered the car battery was dead when I was about to pick up my son James from daycare. So, I had to borrow my husband's car to fetch him. On our way home, James suddenly remarked, "Mom, something's weird with the car." Puzzled, I questioned, "What do you mean?" I could see he was genuinely concerned. Even though everything felt normal to me, he was just adamant. Just pull over. The car sounds different. I'm scared. Seeing the worry in his eyes, I hesitated for a moment, but then pulled over right before hitting the mountain road. What's up with the sound? Sounds okay to me. Can we check the car, Mom? I figured that showing him everything was okay would put. His mind at ease, so I sighed, and we both stepped out. What I saw next was completely unexpected. I'm Naomi, and I'm 35. I'm a working mom living in a rural area. By working, I mean I own an orchard. I took over the family business that my dad used to run when I was in my 20s. Our business, which specializes in high-quality fruits for gifts, and also makes related products, is doing really well. The local community respects us, and I've always had good relations with neighboring farmers, leading a good life. My husband Robert has an online store that sells agricultural items. He's originally from San Francisco, and reached out to my company to include our fruits 
on his website. That's how we first met. Having grown up in the countryside, city boy Robert was a breath of fresh air. We hit it off and started dating. After a year of a long-distance relationship, out of the blue, he proposed. Naomi, let's get married. Ecstatic, I answered. I'm thrilled, but I can't leave my business to move to San Francisco. No worries. I can work from here. I'll move. So, will you marry me? Touched by his dedication, I said yes, and we tied the knot. We settled in a house my dad gifted us. A year into our blissful marriage, I discovered I was expecting. With Robert's unwavering support, I had our son. We named him James, and he's now five. He's a total car enthusiast, always collecting toy cars and watching car clips. I go to the office every day, while Robert handles his website from home. His business has been booming, so we've had a steady income. Work was good, our bond was tight, and our son was flourishing. Everything seemed perfect. But slowly, things began to shift. Citing work commitments, Robert started being away from home more. He used to always be home, but now he'd be out late and gone over weekends, saying it was for work, often leaving James by himself. One day, we had promised James a trip to a motor show he'd been excited about. In the morning, I reminded Robert, Don't forget, we're taking James to the motor show. Get ready. But scratching his head, he said, I can't. I've got work. Frustrated, I snapped. It's Sunday. What about James? He argued. I need to lock in a new supplier. It's for the business. What do you expect? It's not right for James. Can't it wait? As we bickered, James, who'd been engrossed in his toys, began to tear up. Dad, aren't we all going today? James, I have urgent work. James cried. But I wanted us all to go. Clearly irritated, Robert retorted. Stop crying about it. Go with your mom. You shouldn't talk to him like that. Holding James close, I tried to soothe him. Robert, clearly frustrated, went to his room. Sweetie, it'll just be you and me at the motor show. We'll be fine. Robert had never been this short with James. What was happening? Nevertheless, I prioritized our son. So, I took him to the motor show. Just us two. On the way back from the motor show, James, who had been a bit grumpy before, lit up with joy seeing his favorite cars, which helped me relax a bit. Watching him snooze with a wary face in the back seat, I decided I needed to have a heart-to-heart -heart with my husband. Pulling into the driveway that evening, I noticed his car was missing. After tucking James into bed, Robert finally came home. Hey, I said, trying to be cheerful, but he seemed off. You're still up? I wanted to talk about today. You've been putting work first and sidelining the family. It really got to James today. It's work. What do you want me to do? Before I could respond, he handed me an envelope. Curious, I asked, What's this? A buddy at an insurance company 
kept pushing for us to get a policy. I signed us all up. Payments start next month. Confused, I said, Don't we already have insurance? You can never have too much insurance. I opened it up to check out the details. This policy is super comprehensive, even for James. If anything happens to us, it'll be good to have a cushion. It's for James, too. Huh. While I was frustrated he hadn't discussed the insurance with me, I was somewhat comforted that he was considering our family's future. But his attitude didn't get better. In fact, it went downhill. We barely talked. He grew distanced from James. Our arguments escalated, and the atmosphere at home became strained. What had caused this shift in him? The uncertainty kept nagging at me. One day, at work, during a break, I sat with Andrea, a new hire from the past year. And trying to make small talk, I asked, Hey, Andrea, how's the job treating you? She seemed a bit on edge and replied, Hi, thanks to you, it's been good so far. I chatted to ease the mood, and out of the blue, she asked, Your husband's in IT, right? Yeah, he runs an e-commerce site for farming goods. I see. After a brief pause, she ventured, Do you guys get along? Caught off guard, I managed to chuckle. Of course, <laughs> we're good. Why? I've been mulling over marriage and just wondered how it is. She seemed distracted for a moment before diving back into her work. Her comments left me feeling uneasy. Time flew as I juggled work and raising James. The weather shifted and winter hit in full force. One particularly cold morning, despite the chill, I had errands. Like always, I took James to daycare, driving about 30 minutes through some hilly terrain. Later, I parked at our house and headed to work. Finishing up, I stepped outside to a darkening sky and snow beginning to blanket everything. Gotta grab James ASAP, I thought. Back home, Robert was holed up in his room working. When I tried to start my car to retrieve James, it didn't budge. Probably a dead battery. I wonder how that happened. Panicking, I knocked on Robert's door. I need a hand. What's up? I quickly explained to the puzzled husband. My car is not starting. Maybe a dead battery. Can you pick up James? I'm cutting it close. Really? I'm swamped right now. But he needs to be picked up. He cut me off, smiling. Take my car then. Oh, thank you. You're a lifesaver. I grabbed the keys and hopped into his SUV. Typically, I drive the hilly route, but that day, due to some errands at the post office, I decided to swing through town instead. When I reached the daycare, it was pitch black outside. I said hi to the caregiver and picked up James. As we strolled side by side to the dim parking lot, his eyes sparkled with excitement. Oh, are we taking Dad's car today? Yep but I'm behind the wheel. You're a big fan of Dad's car, huh? Yeah, it's so cool. We playfully bantered back and forth as I strapped him in and started the car. A few minutes into the drive, he suddenly blurted out, Mom, there's something weird with the car. Oh, what do you mean? I could see he was genuinely concerned. Even though everything felt normal to me, he was adamant. Just pull over. The car sounds 
different. I'm scared. Seeing the worry in his eyes, I hesitated for a moment, but then pulled over right before hitting the mountain road. What's up with the sound? Sounds okay to me. The tires sound different, not like usual. Can we check? Figuring he'd calm down once he saw the tires were just fine, I sighed, and we both hopped out for a look. To my shock, I saw the tires were regular ones, worn to the nub. Driving with these on our snow-covered icy roads was downright dangerous. The thought of driving our usual icy mountain route with these tires sent chills through me. We had been so lucky to get to the daycare without any issues. Mom, these aren't the tires Dad had on before. He commented, looking up at me with wide eyes. I recalled Robert mentioning he'd switched to winter tires on his car. The pieces clicked together in my mind. Parking the car in a nearby lot, I called for a cab. I made one more call while waiting, and then James and I headed home. Walking in, I saw Robert in the hallway, looking utterly shocked. How'd you guys get back? His words confirmed my growing suspicions. So, it was him. James, go to your room until dinner, okay? I told my son softly, and he hurried upstairs. In the living room, I faced off with Robert. He looked pale and asked, Why do you look surprised? Was it that shocking to see us return safely? I don't know what you're talking about. But I caught him off. James noticed the car wasn't right. Thankfully, we avoided potential disaster. And luckily, I didn't drive our usual mountain route to the daycare today. What are you even saying? He said, playing innocent. My frustration boiled over. Stop playing games. Those worn out tires you put on the car could have killed us both. He tried to mask his surprise and said, What? I don't know anything about that. Deciding it was time to lay my cars on the table, I snapped. Oh, really? Then explain this. I thrust my phone screen in front of him. On it were clear pictures of him getting cozy with a younger woman, kissing, holding each other close at some place. The photos even had captions like, My sweetheart will be tying the knot soon. What are these? One of my staff members is acquainted with your girlfriend. Apparently, she posted these on her private social media. You've got to be kidding me. It turned out that Andrea, the young co-worker I chatted with recently, was the one I'd reached out to while waiting for the taxi. Our chat had raised some flags, prompting me to seek any information she might have. She hesitated, but then shared that her old school friend was the one dating my husband and has shared these pics online. Robert, looking completely thrown off, muttered, I didn't think she'd ever do that. I pushed him. Now, spill it. What were you up to? He finally started talking. The lady at the tire shop, where he'd swapped out the tires, was his side chick. He wanted to be with her, but didn't want the financial burden of alimony. If something happened to James and me, he'd cash in on the life insurance and inherit the business. They had schemed together, putting those worn out tires on his car and messing with my car's battery, ensuring I'd use his SUV. So, you even had your eyes on the life insurance and 
our business. With a desperate expression, Robert pleaded. Naomi, I'm so sorry. It was a stupid mistake. Repulsed, I shouted. Are you kidding me? I can never forgive this. The cops already know, and I'm getting a divorce. I don't ever want to see you again, you jerk. Please, Naomi. Oh, and I'll let all the local farmers know what you did. I bet they'll think twice before working with your website again. Good luck with that. Right then, the sound of sirens grew closer. I handed him over to the authorities. I'd recorded our entire chat, and it was submitted as evidence. He was convicted and did a stint in jail. The divorce was finalized without a hitch, and I walked away with $90,000 in alimony and our combined savings. Left with nothing, family, money, or a job, I could only guess how Robert would cope post-release. While his mistress avoided jail, the word got out, forcing her to skip town. Rumor has it, she's now in the city, living in a shabby apartment, working the late night scene. I'm in the process of suing her for emotional damage. Meanwhile, I'm still running the business and raising James, with a lot of support and kindness from the community. Lately, James has been saying he wants to work for a car manufacturer when he grows up. I'm all in, doing everything to make that dream a reality. From here on out, it's all about James's happiness and carving out a better future for us.